What's up folks, John Walworth here. I wanted to do a video about taking cinematic drone footage, but the more I thought about it, I realized there was just way too much to get into in one video. So this video is going to go over the basics. A lot of what I cover in this video will be applying to both video and still images, whereas the second video is in the series is mainly going to be about video. I see a lot of bad drone photos and especially bad drone video because people bring their drone home and they're so enamored by the fact that they have a flying camera that they don't bother to learn how to properly use it. Even fairly advanced photographers seem to forget what they know when their camera suddenly flies. I would say that new drone users tend to have two styles when they first get started, um, styles in parenthesis. The first one is the, hey, look how high I can fly. And, you know, people go all the way up to 400 feet, which is the legal limit. And then maybe they go a little bit higher than that, um, just because they, they can get up that high. And the second style, if you will, is the, um, I call it the, hey, look a squirrel style, meaning the drone operator tends to find just whatever catches their eye and points the camera at the object, regardless of how jittery or jerky the video might get. Hopefully by the end of this two-part series, you'll be getting great, well-composed images and cinematic looking footage. All right, so the first thing to know and the most important for both photos and videos is to get a correct exposure. This is the absolute basic thing to know. Um, the first step in doing this is to shut off your auto exposure. Auto exposure works by your drone looking at the scene and estimating what a proper exposure would look like. And since the drone doesn't really know what it's looking like, it just has algorithms that it goes off of. And this means that if you're pointing the camera at a grove of trees, which tends to be rather dark, it's going to try to brighten the picture. Whereas if you have a large amount of sky in the shot, which tends to be pretty bright, it's going to try to darken the picture. This means that your exposure can be all over the place if you, if you change your scene. Okay, so I have my camera back into manual mode for the exposure. And I'm going to just touch briefly on using a histogram. Um, you'll see my histogram up in the top to the right a little bit here. I'll zoom in on it a little bit here. Um, I'm using Autel's software. I have an Autel drone. Yours is probably going to be different. But your histogram is the best representation to show whether your picture is in focus or not. If you have data all the way across from the bottom to the top, chances are you have a pretty good exposure. Um, there are other videos on using a, a histogram properly. I'm not going to get into that too in depth right now because you can do that yourself. But um, just to show you, so this is a proper exposure. And uh, let's just go ahead and change things here a little bit. And let's just say I open up my aperture to, uh, to f2.8 to let a lot more light into the picture. Now everything is blown out. Now these cross hatches on my screen show that it's overexposed, but you'll notice my histogram changed. Here, I'm going to change it back just to show you the difference. See how it changed? Everything shifted to the left a bit. Now, if I were to uh, change things to change it to F8 and let less light in, then everything's going to darken and my histogram is going to change as well. Uh, F11 here, letting even less light in. And you'll notice that, that the, uh, the whole right side of that histogram has been, uh, there's no data showing up in it. So in this case, um, the sweet spot is right about here. And since my lighting is not going to change in this scene unless the sun comes out for some reason, I'm able to just leave it there and, uh, and go with it. And I will not have to change anything at this point. All right, so the next thing we need to know about is shutter speed. Now this is where things are really going to differ between taking still shots and video. And I'm going to start with taking photos. When you're taking photos, except in some specific circumstances, you're going to want to shoot with as high a shutter speed as possible. And this will freeze the motion of both the subject and will also minimize any blur caused by the motion of the drone itself. Generally, you want to be able to obtain a shutter speed of at least 1 250th of a second, though faster is even better. The time when this rule doesn't apply, though, is if you're trying to catch the motion of a moving object, like the taillights of a moving car, and you're trying to drag out that blur. In this case, you're going to want to slow your shutter speed down to let that blur happen. For instance, um, in this particular shot, the shutter was open for about half a second. And in this case, the drone has to be very steady for this to work, and you can expect a lot of unusable shots when you try this, even under the best of circumstances. Video is another thing entirely. When shooting video, you want to allow a little bit of blur between frames. The reason for this is because when your eyes see a moving object, it sees motion blur naturally. Because of this, if your shutter speed is too high when you're shooting video, the video is going to look really jittery because your eye sees the individual frames, just like in this example here. Your shutter speed when shooting video should be twice the frame rate. So for instance, if your frame rate is 25 frames a second, your shutter speed should be 1 50th of a second. And this will allow some blur in moving objects, especially ones close to the camera. 
So look at this clip and notice how as we fly over the field, the corn stalks in the foreground blur more and more as, the cl as they get closer to the camera. Here's another example. But you're probably wondering, how do I slow my shutter speed down? I mean, it's really bright out, right? Well, one must have accessory for your drone if you're going to shoot video is a set of neutral density filters or ND filters for short. And these are like little sunglasses you put on the front of your lens and they reduce the amount of light hitting the sensor, thus reducing the shutter speed. Using ND filters, you can slow down your shutter speed without having to change your other settings. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is the files coming out of your drone camera, whether that's photos or video. Um, when your drone comes out of the box, it's likely to be set up as if you don't know what you're doing. Consequently, your, both your photos and your videos are going to tend to be oversaturated, oversharpened, and have way too much contrast. And in your photos, the, the settings are going to be automatically set to JPEG. And while for the casual photographer or video shooter, this is probably going to be fine, for those who want to get most out of their drone, this isn't going to cut it. So let's start with the photos and what a JPEG file is. A JPEG is a highly compressed file where the camera has already decided what the final product is going to be, from white balance to contrast to everything else. All other data is thrown out. Consequently, you have very little ability to edit the picture afterwards without having the quality breakdown. For instance, if your picture is overexposed in part of the sky and it's shot as a JPEG, chances are you're not going to be able to bring back the detail in the sky that's missing. Most consumer drones have the ability now to shoot in a file that's called RAW. In a RAW file, there is much more data on the file than with a JPEG. There's going to be more dynamic range in both the shadows and the highlights, and a RAW file will easily allow you to change everything from color balance to contrast. The disadvantage to shooting a RAW file is that you will need to edit it afterwards in a program such as Adobe Lightroom, although there are other programs as well that can do this. Um, the other disadvantage to this is that it will be a larger file as well. Um, the advantage though, of course, is that you will be able to have a much better quality photo once you've edited it. Video is a little different. Most consumer drones will not shoot RAW video. However, many will shoot either in what's called log, or some will call it a cinematic profile, although the second is not as good as log. Log is essentially an extremely flat profile. It will have very little color saturation and also very little contrast, but it's a much better profile if you plan to edit later on. So here's an example of a video file that was shot in log. I then edited the file in DaVinci Resolve. If you'd like to be able to do this, there's actually a light version of DaVinci Resolve that will allow you to do this, and it's a totally free program as of the time I'm, I'm making this video. In fact, this video itself was actually edited in, in the full version of DaVinci Resolve. I'm not going to get into the specifics of how to edit video, though I might do that in a later video, but if you want to bring your video to the next level, it's a great thing to learn how to do, and there are also plenty of other videos online that can teach you how to do this. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to touch on today. There's so much more I could talk about, but I'm trying to cover only the absolute basics in this video. As I said, I'll be doing another video later about cinematic drone moves for getting better video, but I may also do a video on getting better composition. So I don't know, let me know in the comments what you think about that. Also, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and hit the bell button so when I come out with a new video, you'll get a notification about it. Let me know what other subjects you'd like to cover in the comments, and in the meantime, keep practicing and flying those drones, and we will catch you next time.